Good morning. Hello, 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 everyone. I already see a question. Um, I'm going to click to view the comments. Let's see. Yay. Good morning. The sky's cleared up here in Washington. We're actually looking at Washington for we're kind of, I really want to move out of California and uh, we're kind of keeping our options open, but I've pretty much narrowed it down to Sedona, Arizona, Washington, and Oregon. So we'll see where we land, but um, yeah. So hello out there in Washington. Um, I heard you don't see the sun very often though. <laughs> Good morning, Gigi. Good morning, Doug. Um, I'm gonna be honest. I'm I'm kind of uh, moved to Cape Cod. I love that whole area. Um, I couldn't do the snow. Um, yes, and I'm limited in Arizona because uh, with my um. It's a form of MS that I have. I have neuromyelitis optica and I'm very heat sensitive. So Sedona is still kind of hot, but I love it so much and it's not as hot as the rest of Oregon or Arizona. Um, Kelly says Bend is awesome. It is beautiful. I love it up there in Bend also. Hello, Abby. Hey, Deanna. Um, Deanna is going to be in my high conflict divorce coach certification program, which starts in January. And I don't know if anyone has seen the list of guest instructors. Um, we are rolling out right now. I have never been so excited about a program or a project that I'm doing than I am about the high conflict divorce coach certification program. Um, my reality right now is that um, my calendar right now is booked out until November for my coaching one-on-one -on -one stuff, and I cannot keep up. Um, I could, and I do, there are many days I'm working 12 to 15, 16 hour days, and the demand is so high and there are so many people in crisis that we need more of me. Um, Krista's in there. Okay, now I'm put connecting the dots. Krista is um, also in my certification program. So you and Deanna should connect. Um, I, you know, I have found, I have you know, through this 10-year journey of my own case and having the opportunity to talk to people all over the world, I have so much information in my head and I'm just one person and there's no one else doing this work. You know, there are divorce coaches, there are, I'm kind of jaded on the whole life coach industry. Um, for a whole variety of reasons and that's a whole nother topic. Um, but I, you know, it's, um, something that is so needed because, and it's not that narcissism is all of a sudden a thing. It's always been a thing. We now have a name for it. And we, um, I belong to an organization. I'm one of the founding board members of the NAAA, and that's the Narcissistic Abuse Awareness Alliance, um, with Tanya Guam, with Dr. Romani, um, Barbara Herring, Dr. Catherine Barrett. Um, it's, it's the most amazing collaboration and group of people. I feel like I'm forgetting somebody. Am I forgetting one of our board members? I'm so sorry if I do. I'm, I'm reeling from the news of losing Ruth, um, Bader Ginsburg last night. And, uh, you know, our goal at the NAAA is to make the term narcissistic abuse as common 
and accepted as it is for someone to say that they're an Al-Anon because their ex is a narcissist. You know, it is, this is not a new issue. We're just now starting to talk about it. Um, one of the things that my, I remember calling my dad when I first found out that, or when my therapist first said, you know, I think this is what you're dealing with and had me read the DSM on narcissistic personality disorder. And I remember calling my dad and saying, dad, I understand it. Like, this is what is wrong with my marriage. And I was still married. And at the time I had accepted, well, I had decided that I was going to stay in the marriage. He traveled a lot. And so my goal was to stay until my daughters turned 18. And I remember telling my dad that day what my issue was. He's a narcissist. And back then there was no information out there on it. It was 2008. And my dad's like, okay, you know, whatever you want to call it. In my day, we just called them a-holes. And, you know, we've come so far in 10 years, but this issue is so pervasive and it needs to be accepted as a form of abuse. And one of the things I have a um, webinar that I'm doing for free for a domestic violence agency um, later this month. I'm creating a webinar for them to help them understand because the reality is even the domestic violence communities, they don't understand what you're going through right now. And so my goal is to create a webinar to give them the 101 version of how they can help people and how they can you know, utilize this term to help people understand what they are going through. Um, it, it's so needed. And so I just got way off topic. Um, but anyway, it's... Um, this program in January is, you know, my goal is to pass the torch, to empower others. I want to shift from do, and I'll, if you're already on my client list, I'm not going anywhere. I will still keep, you know, providing my coaching services to anyone who is currently a client, but my goal is to move more towards advocacy and getting out there and changing laws and being a voice for all of you who don't have a voice. And so I'm going to be switching to teaching and empowering others to do what I do so that when I get a call from Twin Cities, Michigan, I can say, hey, you know, reach out to Deanna or reach out to Krista in your area, you know, because she knows the laws in your state better than I do. She knows the players in your state better than I ever could. You know, I'm very well versed in my own local system, but we need people doing what I do all over the country. And so Thank you for the two of you who are joining me today who will be in my program. Um, I really look forward to passing the torch to you and um, teaching you everything I know. And uh, yeah, so let's go ahead and dive in. Um, our first question. So if you are interested in submitting questions, I know we are so backlogged. Um, send it to Tina or no coffee date with Tina at gmail.com. The easier way, which we're going to be transitioning to is our Instagram stories. Pay attention to those during the week. You can submit a question there and we will, we will run with them. And what I'm trying to do now is when we close off here and I schedule the one for next week, I'm putting the questions in there that we're going to be talking about. So you can watch where it's scheduled on our YouTube channel and find out exactly what we're going to be talking about every week. So I'm excited about that. Um, Gigi says, for me, cost is the issue in participating in your training program. Absolutely. And I, I completely understand that. We are... Um, we're offering one scholarship spot for each program. So each session, we have the January session, which was full in less than two weeks. 
And then um, the May session, we're starting May 17th of 2021, open enrollment right now, and we will be awarding a scholarship spot. So if you are interested in applying, you can just go to it's hcdivorcecoach.com, highconflictdivorcecoach.com, and apply. Um, and just specify if you're applying for the program or if you're applying for the scholarship spot. Last time we had, I believe, if I had to guess, about 1,200 applicants for the one scholarship spot. And, um, you know, I we have an amazing woman who is was selected for the scholarship spot, and I'm really excited to work with her, um, a very deserving person. But feel free to apply. Um, we would love to, you know, some of the stories I got from the scholarship applicants, amazing. So, okay, so into the questions, but I do have to do my, um, yes, if you've already applied, Gigi, apply again, because we have some different questions on the scholarship um, application this time or on the application in general. So if you've already applied for the scholarship spot or, you know, go ahead and reapply for this next session. Um, okay. My legal disclaimer, I'm not an attorney. I cannot give you legal advice. I am a divorce coach. I We are coming together as a community of survivors of narcissistic abuse, and I don't I'm not qualified to give you legal advice, so always check with your attorney before you implement any new strategies or take anything from our, our group here. Um, number one, what rights does one parent have to change the parenting plan post-divorce? Um, so every state is different on how they do things. And, you know, so many people get caught up on the terms of family court, in my opinion. Um, people, you know, most orders are temporary. Then there's final custody orders. I will tell you, in my personal opinion, there is nothing final in family court until your kids turn 18. Um, I It's easy to get caught up on those terms. Um, and I know there are some states, I know Illinois is one of them, where you can't file for a year after receiving final custody orders or something like that. And you have to show a major change in circumstances. I believe that's the same in most places, is that you have to be able to show a change in circumstances. I'll tell you, I've been to court probably five or six times since my final custody orders. So, you know, where is the change of circumstances that warrants you putting it or the other party putting it back in front of the court? That's going to be the key piece. Um, but definitely check with your attorney on your state, um, you know, and, uh, because it's different everywhere. But I just encourage you, you know, I see people who put so much energy and focus on getting their final divorce papers. Um, you know, people will email me and say, I've been trying to get divorced for three years and it's still not final yet. Personally, I put that out of your, I would put that out of my mind. It's a piece of paper. What I found is you get that thing in the mail or they hand it to you and, uh, it doesn't make a difference. And that's where we talk about post-separation abuse. Post-separation abuse is everything from the date of separation and sometimes even before that, you know, where this toxic person is telling you you're going to fail, you're going to fall flat on your face, you're never going to survive without me. You know, that is post-separation abuse before separation actually begins. It's planting those seeds of doubt to make you think that you can't do it and you can't leave because they're so fearful of losing control. And that is a lot of what post-separation abuse is as well, um, is their, their need for control. So when I, you know, getting the divorce papers in the mail, it was just another day. I had put so much energy into that piece of paper 
but it made zero difference. And that's not to discourage you, but the reality is, you know, sometimes that divorce paperwork actually spins them even more and can really, I, that's what I saw. I saw an absolute increase in the post-separation abuse that I was dealing with. So, um, but yeah, you know, what rights to anybody, can, my opinion, um, with a change of circumstances or even, you know, in, in some areas here in California, I was the one that was filing and putting court dates on the calendar um, constantly. And usually it goes the other way around if you're dealing with someone who is utilizing the court system for legal abuse, you know, to exert control when they know that, you know, they're trying to run your attorney fees up or, um, you know, that that type of thing, they do use it as a platform. I was the one filing order, you know, or motion after motion because my kids were constantly in danger. We were in court 13 times in 2012 alone, and I guarantee you that 90% of that was me asking for modifications because I had to be able to put my head on the pillow at night knowing that I had done everything to protect my kids, and I remember... As I left the courtroom one day, I said to the the court, I, you know, I am here because I have to know that I'm doing everything to protect my kids. And, you know, it is on the court if something happens to them. You know, that was around the time where my kids almost drowned in a pool. Um, just so, you know, every state is different. Look into what it is in your area. Um, so I'm kind of looking at the comments here. Yes, the list of guest instructors is amazing. Um, it's a marathon. It absolutely is a marathon. And Linda says, great authors, books, Lundy Bancroft and Patricia Evans. I second that. I had the amazing opportunity to attend one of Lundy's retreats in Massachusetts in 2000. 2014 or 15. He is everything you would imagine him to be. He's an earth angel. Lundy is amazing. Um, and Jennifer, your book, The Narc Decoder, is on point. Thank you. Uh, second question, what can, should I say to my child if they tell me unpleasant things through the narcissist? So my guess there is the narcissist is planting seeds, child is coming home and sharing this information or, you know, um, repeating this information. And uh, it's, a, it's a hard, you know, it's hard to give advice on that topic because there are so many variables in everybody's situation. For me personally, when my kids would come home and, you know, say, he called you this name or he said this about you or there was a point in time where my ex-husband and his brother uh, printed out a huge photo, my wedding photo, and put it up on the fireplace mantle and um, took blue electrical tape and covered me. Um, truly sick, sick humans. And my daughters were probably four and six at the time, and they were distraught over this. And, um, you know, it, it's validating their feelings. You know, number one, for me, it was, um, you know, really acknowledging, you know, how did that make you feel? I, I can see you're upset. And that's understandable um, because that sounds like it was very upsetting. And I'm, I'm sorry that dad did that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not okay. And, you know, I don't have all of the answers. Let's wait until Tuesday. They had therapy. Um, let's wait until Tuesday and talk to Miss Sue about it because she may have, you know, some direction or some answers that maybe mom doesn't have. And, you know, and, and tell, letting them know that they shouldn't be, they should not be worried about these things. They shouldn't be subjected to these things. It's not okay. I'm somebody who would say that to my child. Other people may not agree. Um, 
I did. I, you know, it's, it's not okay. That was a poor choice that dad made. And I can see your feelings are really hurt by that. Um, and, and so then deferring it to the therapist, removing myself from the equation so that I can pass the torch to the therapist, number one, so they can help my child. Um, and number two, so it can be documented by a neutral third party that this sick human is doing things like this. So that was always my strategy. You know, what I always say is that this group has so, I don't have all the answers. Um, I will never claim to, but there are some really knowledgeable people who are commenting and I would, you know, make sure you're reading the comments. And if you have experience on any of this, these topics, or tips or tools that you can share, put them in the comments because um, it takes a village. Absolutely. I will say, though, that when I said to my daughters um, that um, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I used to use the terminology when they were really little you know, is that a, a good choice or is that a poor choice? And and I would ask them, you know, ev evaluate your what you're doing right now. Is that a good choice, poor choice, whatever? So during our first custody evaluation, my daughter, who is very mature for her age, very articulate, said to the evaluator, my dad makes a lot of very poor choices. That was taken as I was bad-mouthing him because those were age inappropriate words for a five year old. And so I tried to explain to um, the evaluator that no, this is terminology. I'm not using it about him. I'm use I've been using this since they were very little and it's just part of my dialogue with them. And you know, but the report stuck as what as it was and uh, yeah, and like Jenny says, it really depends on their age too. Um, that that's another variable that goes into that situation. Um, you know, is this a teenager? Is it a toddler? You would handle it different. And whatever experience, whatever age group you have experience with, share your opinions in the comments as well. Um, how can I protect the kids from psychological abuse of the narcissist when the court does not care? Um, it's probably the, the question on all of our minds and the reality is psychological abuse, emotional abuse is nearly impossible to prove in family court. And it's, it's very frustrating because you know what's going on and most of what is said, you know, from your child to you is hearsay. So you can't use it. Um, I have a course on strategic documentation or no strategic communication where I, you know, share with people. So if my child came home and said, you know, dad said you're mean and, you know, I or that you have too many rules and he doesn't have a lot of rules. I personally would send my ex-husband an email that says, hey, Seth, you know, I just wanted to open the lines of communication. Uh, Piper, came, you know, mentioned this morning that you stated I was too strict and that I have too many rules. And, uh, you know, I, I'm hoping that we're both on the same page about encouraging positive, healthy relationships between the kids and both of us. I'm not saying that to him because he's going to all of a sudden step up and be a good parent and go, oh, wow, I should have never said that. I'm a horrible person. Let me sit over here and self-reflect. You know, we all know the narcissist is not capable of that. I did that to take hearsay and put it on the table. So if he communicates with it and it becomes a, you know, it's not like he's going to admit, yes, I said that, you know, it, I'm writing to the judge. That's a lot of what I did. And that's what I talk about in the strategic communication course is so many people give the narcissist all of their power. They're caught up on how is he going to respond to this? Am I going to get an attacking email back? Um, that type of thing. 
I used communicate, not for the first few years. I was very much in a fog and a deer in headlights, but I started mainly from sitting in the courtroom and observing the importance of strategy and the importance of being strategic in your communication. Everything we write is for the judge. Don't give the narcissist the power that they crave by letting them run the show. You know, my my communication was between me and the court because that's the only person I care about. They're the ones making the decisions. And so when you're dealing with emotional abuse, psychological abuse, for me, you know, and it's hit or miss, you know, it may be 5% of the time something that you get documented actually sticks. But bigger than that, you know, because we're dealing with the courts, everything from them just being so calloused to the issues that they see every day that emotional abuse and psychological abuse doesn't even register on their scale of importance. Um, All the way to the other side where maybe the judge is so narcissistic or so corrupt that you have no chance anyway. You know, for me, it wasn't necessarily about proving proving the emotional and psychological abuse. Um, it, you know, it was more about a lot of it was me empowering my kids behind the scenes, never having to do with the narcissist, you know, and that we all have to be working to empower our kids. And because whether it is the narcissist that they're up against, their narcissistic parent, or a toxic teacher or a bully on the playground or, you know, a horrible boyfriend or girlfriend that they're going to encounter when they're 16 years old, you know, we have to teach them the lessons that we did not learn. Um, And you can do all of those things without ever pointing the finger at the other parent and and talking negatively about them. Um, It's very much, you know, knowing what boundaries are that we have emotional boundaries, spiritual boundaries, physical boundaries. Um, you know, we know what um, red flags are in a person. They know what their truth is. Um, you know, all of those things. And they know how to listen to their gut. That, yeah, when that person said that, my gut said they were a little toxic or whatnot. You can use everyday examples, whether it's a book they're reading, whether it's a TV show that you're watching, whether it's an experience with a friend, you know, in their friend circle, use all of those everyday experiences to teach them what healthy is and model what healthy is. It's so easy for us to get caught up in the battle that we, you know, you don't want to look back and go, wow. I was so caught up in that battle that I missed out on my children's childhood, or I missed all of the opportunities to teach them the lessons that they needed to deal with toxic people. And whenever you can have your kids in in counseling, I am a huge fan of it. And even if you can't get your kids in counseling, you connect with a child therapist so you can show up and and ask for the tools and the guidance and the direction that you need to make sure that they come through this as unscathed as possible that's the goal so you know it's it's a hard question um when your kids are being psychologically and emotionally abused and i i don't put any i i don't give I would not, ex, you know, put all of my, my brain is not fully here today. Um, I would not, you know, put a lot of hope and anticipation in the court protecting my kids. My goal has always been to empower my kids behind the scenes because I don't have a lot of faith in the system. Um, unfortunately, there are times they get it and uh, there are times they do not. Um, and that's unfortunately the majority of the time. Deanne said, Deanna says you learn to compartmentalize as well. Um, absolutely. 
that has been huge for me is learning to compartmentalize this battle and say, you know what, today is not my day to deal with my case. Today is my day or this weekend is my weekend to be one-on-one -on -one with my kids, to be in the moment. I'm not going to give the narcissist that power to still control me. Our relationship is done. Right now, it's my priority is, is my kids and ensuring that they're going to be okay. So, you know, that's if I could go back in time, um, I would fine tune that skill, which I do believe I'm good at compartmentalizing. Um, I would fine tune that even more um, because I do look back at, you know, like I said, 2013, I was, or 12, I was in court 13 times alone. That year is a blur. Um, and, and that's heartbreaking because right now my kids are 13 and 15 and I have a small window of time left with them. And so much of their childhood has been wrapped up in this battle. So that's my, my words of wisdom. Um, how do you deal with the ex telling the kids that mommy is keeping them from him? My daughter won't let me confront him because he yells at her. You know, that kind of goes hand in hand with the question that we just went over as well. You know, getting that strategically documented. And yeah, it's a scary situation for our kids to have to be dealing with these people on their own. I understand, you know, when my marriage ended, I was a 34 year old woman and I would have been afraid of him yelling at me. So, you know, we have to, you know, our kids don't have the tools and the life experiences that we have. And even with those tools and life experiences, we were still beaten down by this type of person. So, you know, and, and so my go-to response in a situation like that would be to take the high road and say, you know, mom and dad work with a team of people to decide what's best for our family. And that includes our schedule. And there may be times that I don't agree with the schedule or dad may not agree, but we all have to follow the rules that were created for our family. And so that's my go-to in that um situation. Um, and then the last question, I have a co-parenting group on Zoom that I'm going to be doing right after this. So I'm going to do one more question for today. Um, in the beginning or during your court battle, did you spend any time on an art, a skill, or any type of schooling? Um, I'm assuming that means like getting back into the workforce. Um, my situation, my ex-husband and I owned businesses together and he ran us $1.6 million in debt behind my back. And so by the time everything caught up to him, we lost our businesses, our home, our cars, everything crumbled in a six month period of time. I not only lost my marriage, thank God, <laughs> But I lost everything um, to the point where I was having to ask family members to co-sign for my electric bill. Um, so yes, I did have to go back and start over after being an entrepreneur for most of my adult life. And, um, you know, not, I didn't, you know, go to vocational schools or do any of that. I know so many of you have been stay-at-home parents and are having to reinvent yourself. Um, when everything comes to a head and you're, you know, trying to rebuild. Um, I will tell you, I got my foot in the door with a marketing advertising agency, like a PR firm and a very entry level job, but they let me work from home and I built my way up from there um, and, and ended up moving up and then going to work for another company doing PR. So, you know, I, it took a long time. Give yourself a lot of grace and compassion because it's hard. You know, I, I remember trying to hold a job, trying to be a mom to two very little ones who were both in preschool when I left and I couldn't afford the preschool and, and I had to move preschools and pull them out. You know, it's, it's a lot. And I can't give you, you know, here's one certain formula. 
it is a lot of, you know, survival mode. And a lot of that period of time in my life feels like a blur and it's one foot in front of the other. It's sometimes it's not even one day at a time. It's one hour at a time. And so I've been there and I get it. Um, and, uh, Krista says, what co-parenting class are you teaching? I had done a, um, a lemonade co-parenting class on Zoom and it was six months long, started in June. And so we're halfway through that. Um, but um, to answer your question, so good to hang with all of you and talk to all of you. I really look forward to this every week. So take care and happy Saturday. Um, go out there and be the rock that your kids need you to be.